Good afternoon, guys. Welcome to Leadership Lecture Series. Um, it's not so beautiful outside. In fact, it's pretty darn nasty. So I really um, appreciate you guys. It shows your commitment to leadership development coming out on a very nasty Wednesday. Um, and you know, once it's Wednesday, it's Leadership Wednesday. So that's the bright side of the day. And today we're here with a very esteemed presenter in her field. Um, but before we get to our presenter, just a little bit of housekeeping stuff, okay? So you guys signed in, everyone signed in. If you didn't register, if your name doesn't appear in the sheet, that's because you didn't register in Monarch Link. That's not a problem. Write your names in. Just write legibly so we can understand it. Put an ODU email address. That's usually a good thing. After the sessions, we will send you a post assessment. Okay, once you do your post assessment, you get credit for the workshops on your co curricular transcript. It's an automatic process. Good? If you have questions about how to do any of that, we are wrong. Myself, um, the student in the back, can help you process those and figure out how to go through and figure out Monarch Link. Good? With that said, let's get started. This is Leadership Lecture Series. Today we're here to talk about uh, competent leadership. And this is brought to you by the Office of Leadership and Student Involvement. I'm Denise Simona Rogers. I serve as the Associate Director. And if you have any suggestions for next semester as we're planning, please send those my way. The lecture series is effective if they're serving your purpose of the skills that you wish to develop. And we're always here to make sure that you're getting those skills that complements what you're doing in the classroom. And as I said, we can sit here and talk about leadership all you want, but it's all about you getting some skill set, some theory, and then going out and do some practice. So with that said, let me um, introduce, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Marquita Sparkman Key, who also is here on campus in the Human Services Department. She is well known, in fact, she's been honored by her national organization. And I think most um, precious to her, near and dear to her heart, is the recognition from her students who have um, recognized her as most inspiring faculty. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sparkman Key. All you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I don't know if it's morning or afternoon because it hasn't changed outside since we started today. <laughs> Um, but I am glad to be here to talk about culturally competent leadership. I think that it's very important in the climate that we're in to be effective leaders, but to also be inclusive leaders. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. I identify as an African-American female. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I was in a single parent household. We had about a medium income. My mother always went to school my entire childhood. Now we call her Dr. Wesley. My childhood was a little bit different because I grew up in a big city, but high crime rate, high unemployment rate, low resources. I went to the city of Detroit public school system. Um, I graduated from that system, but it was predominantly black schools that I went to, okay? Which means I didn't have any interaction with other cultures until I went to college. My mother began to introduce me to other cultures when she sent me to camp and camps were a little bit um, more mixed. However, I didn't really get immersed and learn about different cultures until I went to college. Until I went to college. I went to a private Catholic school. So the only diversity in that college was pretty much myself and um, predominantly Caucasian. But I say all of this, why do you think I say all this? I say all of this because all of those experiences shape the lens in, in which I look at the world, right? All of that shapes my understanding of the world. I grew up around my grandmother, who was a homemaker. She had nine children. She, used to, she was a storyteller. She would share a history of our family through storytelling. And many people in African American culture are familiar with storytelling. We always sit around and wait for my grandmother to talk because she did it so well. But she would tell me stories of picking cotton in the field as a little kid, okay? So all of those experiences shape how I see the world. And what we don't realize is that makes up, that helps us to develop our competence or our lack of cultural competence, our lack of experiences or experience. So first we're gonna define cultural competence because I think it's a loaded word. I think that we often use it interchangeably with things like diversity, and it's very different. Once we define cultural competence, we'll take a look at some habits of leaders that will help us to become effective leaders and more culturally competent leaders. I like to talk 
I like everyone to talk to me. So I have some people um, saying some things for me throughout the presentation, but if you have something you want to add to the discussion, I welcome that as well, okay? So when we talk about diversity, we say, you know, oh, it's, it's great, you know, this is a diverse area, um, and we can look at it and tell that the area is diverse because it's quantifiable. We can easily look at the room and look at the different cultures in the room and count that it's diverse, right? So it's easily looked at. But when we think of cultural competence, we look at, look at qualitatively. We seek to understand culturally the cultures that are in the, in the room. So we can't say that this room is culturally competent because I haven't seek to understand the cultures in the room, right? But we can say that it's diverse because we can count that the diversity within the room. You get the difference? So diversity is a recognition that there are some differences and we can look at that visually, look at that. But cultural competence is that evaluation of those differences, again, seeking to understand. The end game in cultural competence is looking at more of the inclusion, including all the voices and experiences and everything. Whereas diversity, the end game is the numbers. We need more people. We need to be more diverse. But once we get them there, what, we do, what do we do with them? Okay. So cultural competence is a process. And we're going to talk about this process because it's a process that has different levels different levels to being culturally competent. It is how we respond, it's how we effectively include all people, regardless of backgrounds and you know, colors and, and diverse factors. It, is, it considers power, who has the power and who doesn't have the power. It looks at things such as privilege, it looks at oppress, oppression, how privilege and oppression work together and can create an environment of oppression. So cultural competence is not shying away from those uncomfortable things that we see within society. It's actually embracing those uncomfortable things and getting an understanding of how these things work together to create the society that we're in. So in order to be culturally competent, you have to be willing to talk about some of those, uncultural, those uncomfortable things like oppression and the relationships between power and privilege. So when I say cultural competence is a process, it's a process on a continuum. There are different levels to cultural competence. And what I challenge is that, I challenge to say that your experiences can shape you on this continuum. So experiences can send us up and down this continuum in different phases. And we were to sit down and take inventory of each person in the room, we may all fall on this continuum in different phases. But if we look at our experiences within our life, we can say that at this point in our life, I was here because of this. Maybe because something happened or a story that I was told or how I was raised. So it's a continuum. The high of that continuum is culturally proficient. It's saying that I am very aware of what's going on in society and I am seeking to change it. I am an advocate for this change. I want to be more culturally inclusive, and I want the environment that I'm in to be more culturally inc inclusive. The total opposite of that is being culturally destructive. And it's saying that my culture is the dominant culture, and it's all that matters. It, it's all that matters so much that I'm willing to destroy other cultures. And what we're going to do is see some examples of what happens in between these different levels of competence. And being effective leaders means that we have to do some self-evaluation and take a look at where we are in our levels of cultural competence and how that impacts our leadership. So I have uh, some numbers around. Will you pass the microphone? Um, who has number one? Can you give us an example of cultural destructiveness? I make a conscious effort, use my power to destroy cultures that are different than my own or from what I think will work best for others. We are all that is important. We are all that is important. Class number two. Sorry. 
So an example of cultural incapacity will be, I am unwilling to be useful or helpful to other cultures. We take care of our own. So I don't even have the capacity to even think about other cultures. I'm taking care of my own. Who has number three? I have my running shoes on. <laughs> cultural blindness. Okay, so cultural blindness. I believe that culture, color, and dimensions of diversity are unimportant, and all people are the same. So everyone just has an equal playing field. I'm not even paying attention to privilege or power and how that interacts with each other, or oppression doesn't even exist. We're just all one. Cultural blindness. Who has number four? I realize that my responses to cultural difference are more often than not culturally destructive, and I'm trying to understand how to respond to culturally confident and proficiently. So this is that part where I start to think about some of the ways that I do things and start to contemplate that maybe I'm not being inclusive. Maybe there are some ways that I can change my actions to be more inclusive. So we're in that pre-phase where we start to think that things aren't right. And we start to examine ourselves a little bit more. Who has number five? Cultural competence is characterized by a commitment to social and economic justice. Yes. So at this point, we are committed to it. We are more culturally competent. And then the next level of that is, here's number six. Cultural proficiency, I hold culture in high esteem and that it is my organizing frame of reference and the foundation by which I understand relationships between individuals, groups, organizations, systems, et cetera. Yeah, so I'm proficient. I am ready to make change. I, high, I value all cultures and now I can advocate for them. So there are different levels to this and you can see how we can fall at any one of those levels at any period of time. There are things that happen within the news, within our society that we see, that we hear about, that can shift us into different levels because it may upset us. But culturally, being a culturally competent leader, the first step to that is being aware, to being able to define what lens that you see the world through and how does that lens shape you. So I have 10 habits that I sort of identify that um, help to shape our understanding of what leaders need to do to be culture competent. So the first step is sort of what I did. I just characterized myself, my background, where I came from, you know, who shaped my view, my grandmother and her storytelling. Those things shaped my worldview. So being able to be a, do an honest, thorough self-reflection is so important. You have to look at yourself and say, you know, what are my biases? Am I um, correct about this culture? Annually, I take students to Jamaica. Annually, we have this conversation about what they thought Jamaicans were like and what they are actually like, right? We are all influenced by what we see in the media. We are all influenced, and we don't even realize that we have a bias until we're there. But when we have this discussion about biases, my students always tell me, I thought everybody smoked marijuana. I thought marijuana was always legalized in Jamaica. It's not true. It's not true. But that's what the assumptions were. Those were those biases that came in. I thought everyone was Rastafarian in Jamaica. They're not all Rastafarians in Jamaica. <laughs> but it, it's, it's those biases that we just see. We see things in the media and we think that it's true. When we travel to other countries, we think that we want to learn about those cultures. So we look at the TV because we're not there. And so we assume that we know everything there is to know. So having this thorough self-reflection allows you to really look at yourself. And it's a hard thing to do because you have to be honest with yourself about your experiences and how they shaped you. Very honest with yourself about those experiences and how they shaped you. And the part that people really have a hard time doing is thinking about what their family's influence on their experiences were. My grandmother was right. Grandma can never be wrong, right? But really, Grandma, everybody's not like this. That was your experience. 
with one person or maybe a group of people, but everyone isn't like that. And being able to challenge those views through that thorough self-reflection. And to be a competent leader, you're going to have to go through this process or you'll never be able to accept other cultures because you will think that you know everything there is to know based on your experiences or your worldview or your, what your family has told you. Intentional relationships. Now we always have this, this, this thing I see in the media. I have a black friend, and it's just a common thing. I have a black friend, you know, so I, I have these relationships and that makes me culturally competent. Really, no, you just have a friend. But having intentional relationships that allow you to grow and really valuing these individuals, their culture, and seeking to understand. I've met so many people in my lifetime, but I never tell them that I know their culture, but I always sit back and listen. I wanna know, what is it that you eat? How do you celebrate your holidays? What is your family like? Of course I'll come to your house, because I, I, I'm nosy like that. So <laughs> I like to be involved with everything, and I've always been like that. I've always been there, always seeking to learn. So those intentional relationships that you have, those cross-cultural relationships, you're seeking to learn. You're seeking to value them and their culture, not to look at them and say that I, my, my culture is a dominant culture. I'm better than your culture, and I have this one friend, so now I know all about your culture. You know, it, it, that's not true. I don't know everything about it, but I'm seeking to learn, and I want to have authentic relationships. And if you're a leader, that's going to be important with your employees because most employees can see if you're being fake or if you're being real. They can see if you're really valuing their opinion and their views culturally or if you're looking down on them because they won't begin to speak or share things with you. Now, resistance is a, a big issue. Because you may be more culturally competent, but you may be within a system that's not ready for that, right? And so you have to push against the system, the current hierarchy, in order to embrace cultural competence within your, your departments or within the system in which you work. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable, willing to be that advocate, willing to push against the system if necessary to order to create this inclusive environment. Because most, today you will see that most institutions want to become um, more inclusive culturally, but they'll say things like, we are diverse. And it's like, yes, when I walk in here, I see a lot of colorful faces, but you're really not inclusive. They're just here. They don't have a voice. They're not welcome. Their culture isn't represented. You only celebrate certain holidays. They're not included in that environment. And so you have to push against that system in order to create change. You have to know that it's going to be difficult. It's going, anything worth changing is difficult. It's even difficult being a leader of a very diverse work, workforce, being inclusive and understanding all the cultures that are there, having everyone have a voice, and then embracing those differences. That's uncomfortable because there's a lot of voices. There's a lot of differences. There's a lot of different backgrounds. But being able to embrace that discomfort, saying that this discomfort is good and it's going to move us forward, but it's also moving me forward, is important. You have to know your contribution. Now, this is, again, a part of that self-reflection, understanding yourself. What do you contribute to the marginalization of people? What do you contribute? What is your power? What is your privilege? What are your resources? How can you use your power, your privilege, and your resources to be more inclusive? Because everyone within your environment won't have the same level of power, privilege, and resources. And being honest with yourself, saying that I know that I have power. I know that I have privilege that not all people have. Now how can I turn that around and use that in a way to make everyone feel included? How can I use my voice and my position to drive change? 
Now, I'm talking fast, so if you have any questions, please let me know. I always talk fast. <laughs> but ongoing evaluation is important. I teach program evaluation, so evaluation was going to be in here. That's one of the courses that I teach. Um, <laughs> but ongoing evaluation is important as a leader. If I stated that we all fall somewhere on this continuum and our experiences shape us and we can go to different levels at different times based on where we are in life, then we're going to always have to evaluate ourselves and evaluate the positions that we're in to ensure that we're still being inclusive, that something hasn't changed, that policies and practices within the organization are inclusive to all the members that are represented. Maybe at one point they were inclusive, but then we had some new cultures that we hired, some new voices that came into the system, and now we need to go back to the drawing table and make it more inclusive for those new people. So ongoing evaluation is important. Ongoing self-evaluation, ongoing evaluation of leadership style, ongoing evaluation of the organization's policies and practices. Habit seven, to create an inclusive environment. Now we want, this is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. You're not going to go into an environment and say, oh, we're all inclusive and we can continue to work. But you have to develop that trust and that rapport with all the different individuals, all your employees, everyone that you're working with. You have to value diversity. You have to be able to accept and support those cultural differences, making people know that you are genuinely interested in their voice, letting their voice be heard. You have to be always culturally self-aware. And I, I like that point because there are terms that we use maybe in our families, within our, our homes and our cultures that we don't even realize is offensive to different groups. We think it's okay until we say it to someone and they have a, a, a response back to you that's not so favorable and you're trying to figure out what just happened. So being culturally self-aware means what you don't know, maybe ask. What, what should I call you? What is your nationality? I just want to understand more. But also being self-aware in every decision you make, making blanket decisions that impact everyone may not be feasible when you have a diverse workforce. Making rules that people can't, I was, I did, uh, for about 10 years, I did evaluation for Head Start. There was one Head Start agency that said no one can leave on their lunch hour. No one could leave the premises on their lunch hour. So everyone had to stay within the facility for lunch. What do you think that means for individuals who culturally needed to do something within that lunch hour? They had to stay on the grounds during their lunch. That wasn't an inclusive decision. That was a, a corporate decision that just came down and everyone just had to stay here. But that wasn't a decision that included everyone. That wasn't a decision that allowed for people with special dietary concerns to be able to go home and take care of whatever their dietary issue is and come back. That wasn't a decision that allowed for individuals who needed to pray during their lunch hour to be able to go and pray and come back. This was in a large facility. This was a very small building with just a couple classrooms. So it was, there was no big um, area for them to all sit in for their lunch hour. So to leave everyone there, there was no real privacy. There was no real downtime. So that decision came down from management, but it wasn't a decision that took into account everyone. They weren't culturally self-aware. They didn't ask for everyone's input when they made a decision like that. So in your decision-making, making sure that your decisions don't have a negative input that gives one culture an advantage but oppresses another is important. Understanding the dynamics of difference. When we all bring to the table differences, a different worldview, different experiences, different lenses, there's two things that can happen. 
we have all these great ideas, and it's just wonderful, but it's so many ideas that we never get anywhere, and it's difficult, right? So understanding that having so many differences will be a challenge trying to get everything on the same accord that's going to benefit everyone. But embracing the same differences to be able to create an inclusive environment is important. So we're not taking the easy way out. We're making, making sure that everyone has a voice as a leader, but making sure that everyone is welcome in that voice. It's not the easy way out. It is a more challenging way. Knowledge. This seek to understanding is a, a big thing. We need to gain information on the employees in which we work with. We need to seek to understand them, seek to understand their environment, seek to understand us. I'm in human services. There's a high turnover rate of case managers in human services. The reason why it's a high turnover rate is because it's low pay and it's a lot of work. They like to pay employees salaries so that they can work you, you know, 60 hours and you still get paid the same salary. There's no overtime. So it's a high turnover rate. It's a high turnover rate, too, because no one is really listening to all the employees that's, with, that's within that environment, gaining understanding, seeking to understand their culture, what are their living conditions. If people are living in poverty and working very hard, then of course I'm going to go for that job that's paying $2 more. Of course I'm going to go for the job that's hourly and not salary. But if you have a culture in which the leaders, the people that are in charge, the managers, they are understanding and having a good relationship with their employees, the money won't matter because they'll feel welcomed and they'll feel supported. And the other thing is that in everything you do as a leader, you have some power because you're a leader. You're leading a group of people. And so the next level of that being culture, culturally competent is advocacy. So you take it to the level of trying to institutionalize that cultural knowledge that you have to move your agency forward, to move your department forward. Because again, you may be culturally competent, but you may not work in an environment that's systematically ready to handle that systematically ready to handle all that diversity and all that inclusion. So then you have to work to institutionalize all that knowledge that you have so that you're driving the field forward. So you're driving, driving the, the agency forward that you're working for. And this is a step into becoming transformative leaders. So it's not enough to just be a leader, but to be a transformative leader, it has an ethically sound grounding. You are trying to transform the workforce, moving them forward by being more inclusive in not only your understanding of the cultures, but in institutionalizing your understanding so that policies and practices are more inclusive and move the entire agency forward, move the workforce forward. And this is a new term that's out now. Everything is about being transformative leaders, being transformative leaders. Leadership role, are you talking to me about how you want to be a transformative leader and what that means for you? It's a buzzword, but it also means that you have to do a lot of things internally to be more inclusive and competent so that you can actually be a transformative leader and really take that agency to the next level. So if you are a leader, everything that I said was <laughs> basically you have to be willing to learn more, do more, grow more, and then you can lead. You just can't wake up and say, I'm a leader, and I'm inclusive, and I like all people. That's a growth process. You have to be honest with yourself and say, this is where I'm at, and this is where I want to be, and this is how I need to get there and be very purposeful in the decisions that you make and the relationships that you make so that you can move forward.
so that you can move into that transformative mindset. Thank you. Any questions? I talk really fast sometimes, <laughs> so you guys have to help me. Any questions for me? And thank you to all those that read for me. I think my presentation will be available. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Yesita. My major is educational leadership. I would like to ask if we are a leader in an institution and our uh, community is uh, diverse, and should we uh, adapt that to their culture or we still keep insists our culture, but we uh, provide them some facilitations to in order not to have a, a crash in the culture? What is your opinion? I didn't quite understand. Uh, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I think, let me see if I got a good understanding. You're asking, like, if you're, in, you're working as a leader in a diverse culture already? Uh, yes, in my country. So uh, if we have to uh, facilitate uh, the, what is it, the culture barrier, or we still keep in seats in our culture? So I think if you're working in a diverse culture, you have to facilitate an environment where all those cultures are included and, included, and not just your specific culture or the majority culture. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you. it's not. So when we go into an environment, there is a majority culture. That majority culture has the power. They have the privilege. They have the resources. However, to move to this transformative leadership mindset, you have to embrace all the cultures that are present, giving them all a voice, giving them all the opportunity to be heard, and then embracing those different cultures as well. And I'll tell you how I saw, I'll give you an example of, um, as I stated, for about nine years, I was the evaluator for Head Start. There was one Head Start agency that was in a local community and in this community, there was a large Muslim population, and I'm in Detroit. So if you know anything about Detroit, it's a large Hispanic population, it's a large Muslim population, um, and then in this community was African American. And so this one agency embraced every single culture within that community by making sure the staff was diverse, the staff looked like the children, making sure every holiday was celebrated and represented. It. it was the most colorful agency I had ever seen because everything was on the walls, all the different people, all the different colors, just all the, everything. That one agency took it upon themselves to be inclusive and make every kid that came into that agency feel welcome and every parent welcome. And they, that was a process, finding employees that looked like the children, hiring those employees, understanding those cultures, embracing those cultures, and the manager of that agency is still there because she was good at it. And people who are good at what they do and value their employees, they usually keep their teams and they usually keep their agencies together. And it's, that was a process. That agency didn't just jump up and just all of a sudden were inclusive because it didn't start off. That area in which the agency was in was predominantly an African-American population. Over time, that agency shifted and, and got more students in that had all these different backgrounds and different cultures, and they had to shift. They even had a World Culture Day where they had different foods from all these different cultures, and the kids came dressed up and could show, you know, I'm from here, and this was my culture, and these are the things that we ate. They had special dietary menus that they served the food, or served the children, because some children in some cultures couldn't eat certain things, like they had to have halal meats, um, and so they had... Um, people that came and prayed over the meats. And, and I mean, they embraced everything in this one agency. But it's a process. It's definitely a process. But in order to transform an agency, you definitely have to embrace every culture there. Good question. Anybody else have a question?
So you said you run a study abroad program in Jamaica, right? Yes. Um, how did you choose Jamaica, and what do you like uh, doing study abroad there? Um, so I started off in Costa Rica, so I had a little trial and error. Um, I started off doing study abroad in Costa Rica. Language was a big difference, a big barrier for us, because the study abroad that I run is service learning focused. So we don't just go and, and learn and take from the culture. We, lead, we give back to the culture while we're there. And so we started off in Costa Rica. I went to Jamaica because I was familiar with Jamaica. I had been there before. Um, I felt like I would be comfortable interacting in Jamaica. Um, but the first year I did it, I mean, it was like, you know, a trial. Like, will this work? And it actually worked, and I've been going there for four years. Um, what I like about taking students to Jamaica is the rich culture. It's so diverse that they learn so many different things from art to food to, you know, Rastafarian, which is a culture by itself. Um, but also we get to work with a very vulnerable population. Um, and we work with pregnant teens. And in Jamaica... There's a Christian foundation in um, the government, I want to say, in you know, how they do things. So if you become pregnant as a teen, you're immediately kicked out of school and can't come back. There's an organization that has worked with the government to get these kids back in school. But if you can imagine that a teenager who's pregnant, the embarrassment of being pregnant, of being kicked out of school, um, a lot of the families are impoverished, and so they, their hope was that their child would be the one that would make it. But if you get pregnant, then you didn't make it. So they have a lot of low self-esteem, and what we work on is self-esteem development when we go there. Um, and so I will probably forever go back there just because I love working with the girls. So, does that answer? Yeah, it does. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to spring break. So if anybody want to go, we're going to spring break this year. A question. Um, you described your journey in becoming or culturally competent, and you were, you know, Brett pointed out that it's critical that we recognize it's a process. What recommendations do you have for, like, people sitting in this room that interested in continuing their journey from wherever they are to becoming more culturally competent? I'm going to tell you what I did with my children. Um, I was a single mother for about a decade. And I had, I had a passport, but I hadn't had any stamps on it, so I hadn't been anywhere. I haven't met anyone. But I knew within my culture we had a strong Middle Eastern culture and we had a strong Hispanic culture, and I wanted to know about all these different cultures, populations, people. And so what I did is I started visiting museums. I started talking to the curators at the museums. I started having lunch with people. Um, anyone that I met, I would talk to. Me and my children, we had... Um, we had we call it Mexican town in Detroit, and it's, it's just the name of the area with a lot of different Mexican food. But we would go to the restaurant and talk about authentic food, talk to the waiters, talk to the waitresses, and just really exposing them to different things. Um, we've, we have a Polish community with different Polish foods. We have a Greek community. And so what I did is start just introducing them to different cultures. And funny thing is, Food is a big aspect of different cultures. <laughs> it's just a big aspect of it. Um, and then we would just talk. We would talk to the owners. We would talk to the people there. And we would talk about cultural traditions to the point where I, it started opening my mind up and it started opening their mind up too. Now my kids, they want to go everywhere. Um, we can't quite afford them to go everywhere. But they're open to different cultures. So I would say you can start small by embracing the person in your class that's different from you. Um, you can start by going places that you would never have been to just to learn about other cultures. Museums are great for that. The people that work at the museums usually look like what's going on in the museum. So asking questions about people's culture, getting to know people next to you, asking them where they're from and what is it like in their country. People love to share knowledge if you really genuinely want to know. And I'm one of those nosy people that always want to know. So I ask questions. What is it like? What is your traditions? What, are, what do you do for the holidays? What do you celebrate? I mean, when I go get my nails done, we talk about her whole culture the whole time that we're there. She asks me, like, what do I do? I tell her what do we do. She tells me what they do and what they eat and what she's tried and what she's willing to try, and we exchange. It's about being open. 
just really open to expanding your mind and your capacity and not being limited to your environment, your culture, and what you've seen and what you've heard. It's about also doubting and challenging everything that you've learned from family and other people's experiences and really trying to experience for yourself. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that is very helpful. I <laughs> have a follow-up part to that question. Okay. So sorry, I asked a lot okay. of questions. I'll go take that in classes too. <laughs> <laughs> but my follow-up is this. Oftentimes when you're exploring other cultures and you're getting to know, it's good to have that curious and open mindset. But at times we might make missteps or mistakes. How do you recover from that? What's, what's your advice on that part? Um, especially as we're thinking about resiliency, I would want someone to you know, make a, a little misstep and then pull back completely from that open-mindedness or discovery. I mean, if you say something wrong, like you don't know the culture. And, and so if you say something wrong and you, or if you do something wrong, it's okay to say, oh, I'm sorry, did that offend you? I, I didn't know. You know, and let them explain to you why that was wrong to say. Just, again, just being open to learning and being corrected. We're not perfect, especially when we're learning about different cultures. My students make mistakes all the time when we go to Jamaica, all the time. And, you know, they're used to it. And they, and Jamaicans will correct you. And it's not always nice. <laughs> <laughs> they will correct you. But... You can't be afraid. I mean, I ha always have my, my, I have had students come to me, you know, panic, crying, like, oh, you know, they're mocking me. And because we go work with 13 year olds, they're going to mock you because you look different. But really, I tell them it's not, they're not mocking you. They like what they see. And you're taking it as a negative when it may be a positive. Let's go back the next day and see how it goes. So the next day is always totally different. Oh, she told me I was pretty today. See? You thought she was mocking you, but you were so different from her that she was really just engaged in how different you were, even though they were laughing and playing. That was 13-year-old stuff, right? Um, but we can't be afraid to make mistakes. I, I went to Germany this summer, and I asked for wine. I drink wine, so I asked for Riesling, and he kept correcting me. It's like Riesling, like rolling it off his tongue. And I said, look, you know what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> And then he laughed. <laughs> but I mean, so we, we mess up. But why not learn and try? Explore and learn about other cultures. Why not? What are we going to lose from doing that? What are we going to lose from messing up? They're going to correct us. Good. Anybody else have any questions? Well, please join me in expressing a huge thank you for Dr. Sparkman Key. Coming out, sharing your knowledge and your um, culturally competent journey with us. We do appreciate it. I have a small token. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy it. And I'm in the education building. If anyone wants to get in touch with me or ask me any questions or come to Jamaica, I go every year spring break. That's yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, you will get your post-assessment in your email. Please complete your post-assessment. Some of you have been to three lectures for this semester already. Once you complete your post-assessments for those three or more, you can start picking up your certificate at the leadership office, okay? If you're in the comprehensive leadership program, you know that's nine assessments, but you also still get your certificate for the six. Any questions will be around to help you out. If you didn't get your post-assessment, let us know. We'll be around to help you out with that. Thank you so much, Marquita. Thank you.